want to talk to you about today's message, Overcoming an Identity Crisis. For the last several weeks prior to the last week, and I think there was another gap in there, we talked about a number of things during this summer. It's not really a series. Uh, but they kind of connect one to another. I talked about, you know, being a, a faith-filled, not fear-filled, and all the fear that's going on in the world. I talked to you about overcoming negativity. I talked to you about being diligent, the need to be diligent in our lives. And, and then today, I really felt uh, like, in fact, the, two weeks ago, I talked about baggage and losing our baggage. And today, I want to talk to you about, uh, about this idea of overcoming an identity crisis. How many of you know it? I know you do. If you follow the news, there's so much talk today about your identity. Isn't that right? There's there's so many people with an identity crisis today. How many of you have understood that and seen that today, right? I mean, they've got, uh, they've got a gender identity crisis. They've got a, a racial identity crisis. I, I, mean, I mean, there's just tons of uh, crises going on in terms of people understanding who they are. But I want to declare to you today that as born-again born believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have to wonder who we are. We've got a book that tells us who we are. Amen? And we need to hang on to who we are in Jesus Christ. And so I just want to uh, build your faith today, remind you perhaps of some things you've already known. Uh, but you know, it is so vital that we know who we are in Christ from the Word of God. Amen? And so we're going to deal with that and remind you, stir you up a little bit today and help you understand. Because there's even people that are uh, claiming to be Christians and maybe they are. But yet they're still suffering from some kind of identity crisis. My wife was reminding me uh, this morning because, you know, she's a little older than me, so she remembers these things better. And so, uh, she, she, but she was reminding me about the 60s and 70s and how, you know, people are going through identity crises then and, you know, talk about identity and, and all that kind of thing back in those days as well and, and suffer from that. So, you know, everybody going around talking about, well, I just got to find out who I am. How many of you have heard that before? I got to find out who I am. I got to get in touch with myself. I, I got to just figure myself out. Thank God uh, to be a believer in Christ and one who loves the scriptures and the word of God. It's easy to know who you are. Amen. That was weak, but it's true anyway. Amen. Amen. And just so you know, she's only six days older than me. Six days older. And so, uh, you know, when she turned 50 and I was still 49, boy, did I have fun. Oh, for six days. It was short-lived. Hallelujah. All right, so we want to, you know, I get a week off, and now I just, you never know what I might say today. Amen. Yeah, you can see that. All right. Hallelujah. We might have to edit this video in many ways. All right, so let's talk about this idea of our identification, our identification with Christ and understanding what our identification is with Christ. That might be a new expression to you, this idea of our identification with Christ, but this is a biblical, a theological terminology that is known uh, by uh, Christians and theologians, this idea of our identification with Christ, and it's so vital. This is one of the most important subjects uh, in the Word of God, our identification with Jesus Christ. Let's start off uh, by talking about what do we mean by identity? or identify, or identity. You can put either one of those, all right? What do we mean by that? It means this. This is from Webster's, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, Collegiate D Dictionary. It says, first of all, to be or to become the same as. All right? To be or to become the same as. So when we're talking about, now we're going to deal with our identification with Christ. To be or to become the same as. Keep that in mind, and we'll be reiterating it in a couple of minutes as well. Secondly, to cause to be or become identical. Everybody say identical. That's an important word in order to understand our identification with Christ. And then thirdly, and I hit the wrong button, that's all right, we fixed it. Number three, to conceive. Now note this, to conceive as united, as in spirit, outlook, or principle. Now think about this, you know, all over our nation, probably all over the world, there's always people that are seeking to identify with something, whether it be a group, whether it be a club, whether it be an a, a organization. They're always seeking, it seems, there's something built into our nature that wants to find a place where we can identify with others. How many of you know what I'm talking about today? I mean, a few weeks ago, I was driving somewhere uh, on the thruway, I think. I was driving on the thruway, and all of a sudden, three or four guys come by my van and, and on motorcycles, and they've got these leather jackets on, and on the back of the leather jackets, it says Hell's Angels. And so the Hell's Angels, at least a few of them, were passing me on the thruway. And, and again, what are they doing? By having the name Hell's Angels and by riding the motorcycle, what are they doing? They're finding a group 
that they can associate with, that they can identify with, as it states in this, to conceive as united, as in spirit, outlook of principle. And so they got similar principles, similar values, and they unite together under that, that, uh, that heading called Hell's Angels. How many of you understand what I'm saying to you? And, and it seems like, I mean, we could go on and on. Uh, talking about, you know, different groups and different things like this in order to find some kind of sense of commonality with others so that you feel like you belong. Because people have this need to belong, don't they? Are you getting anything out of this this morning? And so people have this need to belong. And, and because of that, as I said, they join groups or clubs or associations, some of them good, some of them not so good, right? Right? And so, you know, today we have, you know, associations with transgenders because they are, you know, their gender identity. First of all, I'll say this again. How many of you know you can't ever change your gender? Did you know that? Do you know you either have two X chromosomes or two X or an X and a Y chromosome? I mean, you can't change that. I mean, you can pump yourself with chemicals or hormones or drugs and, and make yourself look and pretend to be uh, the other sex. But the reality of it is, if you're born a male, you're always a male. If you're born a female, you're always a female because the chromosomes never change. Is everybody with me here today? It's so important because people have this notion that you can actually go under or, or undergo a sex change. You can't. You're always either male or female. It never changes. You can only pretend uh, to be the other. Is everybody with me? Yes. I remember reading that long ago about this uh, person, not reading, I saw it on the news, about this white lady who said that she's black and she had gone under saying that she was black all the time. She says, I identify as black. But you know, no matter what she does, she is what she was born to be. Isn't that right? I mean, we can't just choose, you know, things like that. Isn't that right? Amen. And so, again, you know, people are trying to identify with things that they can't because they want to identify outside of factual things, outside of truth. People want to avoid truth, don't they? And see, as our society has increased in, in relative truth, you know, everything's relative. My truth might not be your truth. You know, uh, you know truth is kind of, you know, it's, it, it's, it vacillates. There's nothing solid to stand up. And so truth is all relative, you know. And, and so as our society has advanced in that idea, now they're beginning to uh, try to use that or apply that uh, to every area of life where, you know, if a man chooses to be a woman, he can go in the ladies' room. Confusion. Satan is the author of confusion, isn't he? But for we who are believers, and you say, well, this is not politically correct. That's right. We are not politically correct. We want to be biblically correct. We want to share truth. Why? Because truth is what real love is. Love wants to help somebody. Amen? And, you know, I felt so bad for this. And this is kind of, I hope this doesn't mess with your mind too much. I saw this guy somewhere, this video again. And this guy must have been in his 30s or 40s. And he claimed, I identify, he says, as a 12-year-old girl. He dressed in a pink dress. He had long curls. And I looked at that guy and I felt so sorry for him. What confusion. This poor, And yet people are saying, well, you need to be how you feel. Why wouldn't we want to help that individual to be free of these things? Does love say, well, you just be how you feel? Or does love say, let us help you? Because there's obviously some, some mental issues here that need to be dealt with. And we can help you because we really love you. Because you're not a 12-year-old little girl. You're in your 30s or 40s and you're male all the way. You understand what I'm saying? Is everybody with me here today? We're talking about real life stuff. We're talking about what's in the news and, and all these things. Because I'll tell you something, the Word of God and the Spirit of God are the answer for every confusion there is out there in this world. Amen? Amen. I know, I know. Some pastors, they tell me, well, you shouldn't talk about that. Just preach the Word. I am preaching the Word. And I'm also applying it to everyday life because there's a whole world out there saying, what does, what does the Bible have anything to do with 21st century uh, uh, America or the world? Well, let me tell you something. The Bible applies to 21st century. There's truth and there's, there's relevance in the Scripture for every, every century, for every generation, isn't there? And if we'll hold to it, if we'll live by it, it'll set people free. And that's what Jesus came to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
And so understanding our identification with Christ, going on with this, our identification with Christ means this as we put this together. What does it mean? It means Jesus was our substitute acting in our place so that we were accredited with what he did. Now, we're going to elaborate on that in a little while, but let's just go on. Number two, there's basically two aspects to our identification with Christ. The first one is Him being our substitute, acting in our place so that we were accredited with what He did. Well, you know, just to elaborate on that just a little bit, how many of you know Jesus represented you and me on that cross, didn't He? And you and I are accredited with that death. And we're going to deal with that in just a couple of minutes. We're accredited with His death. From God's perspective, you and I died on that cross because Christ represented us. How many of you know He didn't deserve to die? You and I deserve to die. He never sinned. You and I have sinned. And the wages of sin is death. Second part, Jesus became as we were so that God viewed Him as being us. He was treated as though he were us. Remember this idea of identify or identity? It has the idea of treating is the same. Treating is the, in the same way. And so God treated Jesus as though he were us in terms of judgment for sin. Jesus took our judgment so that we could be forgiven and acquitted in the courts of heaven. Amen? All right, so this, of course, is the basis of our identification with Christ. Going on, let me just share, share with you some quotes uh, from Christian leaders that I think are going to explain this a little bit better. Are, are, is everybody doing all right today? Yes. I pray that you'll come back next week. I, I, but anyway, Ellie Maxwell, who was a Bible college professor many years ago, back in the, uh, he was born in the late 1800s, but most of the 20th century, he said this, believers in Christ were joined to him at the cross, united to him in death and resurrection. We died with Christ. He died for us, and we died with him. This is a great fact true of all believers. We're talking about identity. We're talking about identifying with what he did. We're talking about the fact that he was treated as though he were us and was punished for yours and my sin. And really, when we talk about this, and I'll probably get ahead of myself by saying this, but that's all right, we'll come back to it. We're really talking about covenant. When we talk about being united to Christ, we're talking about the idea that we are in covenant with God through the blood, ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a uniting this that has taken place. Notice what uh, the next uh, individual, E.W. Kenyon, in his book, he's got a little book called Identification, excellent book. It says this, or he said this, this gives us the key that unlocks the great teachings of identification. Christ became one with us in sin, that we might become one with him in righteousness. He became as we were, to the end that we might be as he is now. He became one with us in death, that we might be one with him in life. There is a twofold oneness. First, his oneness with our sin on the cross. Second, our oneness with him in his glory on the throne. These are powerful truths. Let me tell you a story. Amen. You can rejoice. Let me just tell you a story about a boy. And this boy was, you know, raised in a good family and, uh, you know, had a lot of love in that family and everything. But this boy was just sort of, he was just sort of intro, very introverted, really. Not even so, very introverted. Somewhat backwards, couldn't be around a lot of people without panicking almost. Not literally panic attacks, but just not comfortable. Very uncomfortable around other people. And, and uh, didn't have hardly any friends in school and, and struggled. You know, I don't know if you've ever related to this. Maybe some of you have. But, you know, when it came to lunchtime, you know, he wasn't sure who he could sit with at lunch because he didn't really have uh, any friends to speak of. Maybe a few that were kind of friends, but he couldn't totally trust them. Very introverted, very alone, uh, feeling very alone in so many ways and, and felt at home uh, by himself more than anything else. But then one day that boy, he began to be taught the Bible. And he began to find out what the scripture had to say about him. The scripture began to, or the preacher that he began to listen to began to teach him about the idea that he is, as we sung a song earlier, that he is more than a conqueror through Christ who is the one who brought him victory. Amen? Found out that he has the ability uh, to have the wisdom of God in the mind of Christ because Christ is called our wisdom. Amen? He began to find out that he could do all things through Christ who would give him strength. He began to find out a scripture after scripture of, of things the Bible had to say about who he was and what belonged to him and his inheritance. 
And let me tell you something, when he began to hear those things and began to understand those things, he began to be set free from being an introvert and, and from being one who uh, would rather be alone. He began to be set free from all those things. And it changed the whole course of his life. And that boy was me. That boy was me. He really was. So these things are so important for us to know and to get a hold of and let God change our lives. Notice what a man by the name of Neil T. Anderson, he's got several books, one of which, which is called Who I Am in Christ. And he said this in referring to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, 10, 11 says, We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised, or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, how we formally, notice what he says, how we formally identified ourselves no longer applies. When asked to describe themselves, people usually mention race, religion, cultural background, or social distinctions, but Paul said none of those apply anymore because our identity is no longer determined by our physical heritage, our social standing, or racial distinctions. Our identity lies in the fact that we are all children of God and we are in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. There's no black and white. There's no, uh, you know, rich and poor. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, slave and free. In Christ, we are all one in one family. Is that not right? Is everybody with me here? Because we have come and been united together with Him as a family of God in Christ. Christ in us. He in us and us in Him, uh, uniting together. Notice what uh, the well-known preacher said, J James Montgomery Boyce. Are you getting anything out of this today? He said this, the phrases in Christ, in Him, occur, you know, those types of phrases, in Christ, in Him, occur about 164 times in all of Paul's writings. See, these phrases are especially in the epistles of Paul. The phrases mean more than just believing on Christ or being saved by His atonement. They mean being joined to Christ in one spiritual body so that what is true of Him is also true for us. That's a powerful statement. That last statement, notice that the uniting or the joining together of the believer with Christ in one spiritual body so that what is true of Him is also true for us. You need to be thinking about that. Meditate on that. That is a powerful statement for you and me to grab a hold of. Amen? Amen. All right, now let's just talk about discovering your identity in Christ. Uh, let's just deal with some of this in the last few minutes that we have. Is everybody all right? In the New Testament epistles, now take note. It's important to look for phrases like, now when you're reading especially Paul's epistles. Paul's epistles are the majority of epistles. Epistle means letter. Somebody said, the epistles are not the wives of the apostles. You understand that, right? All right. The epistle, epistles mean letters. And so especially in Paul's letters, right? It's important to look for phrases like in Christ, in him, through him, through Christ, with Christ. Phrases like that, etc. These will almost always point to your union and your identification in Christ. They will almost always point and tell you who you really are now that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so discovering your identity. First of all, you died with Christ. Let's just look at some scriptures on this. I'm not going to take a long time here today. I just want to strengthen you. I want to build your faith. I want to help you realize that for the believer, there should be no confusion in terms of yours and my identity. Amen? Amen. And so you died with Christ. Say, I died with Christ. Notice what Galatians 2.20, Paul said this, I have been crucified with Christ. Notice that terminology, that phrase, with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul says, and it didn't just apply to Paul, it applied to every believer, that we were crucified with Christ. As I stated earlier, when Christ was crucified on the cross, from God's perspective, you and I were there. That's why when we put faith in Jesus Christ, 
We don't have to fear being, being put to death for our sin because we have already been put to death for our sin in Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's been punished in our stead. United together with him. Notice Romans 6, 6 through 8. You can write these down. This will also be on, on the website this week. But notice now, Romans 6, 6 through 8. Knowing this, Paul wrote Romans, and he wanted us to know this, and to know this well. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with, or uh, rendered harmless, or rendered inactive, or no longer have power over us. That, that body of sin, that sin nature. We died. The old man died. How many of you know the Bible talks about the old man before Christ and the new man after Christ, right? Is everybody with me? The old man died. The old man was crucified with him that the body of sin or the sin nature in the body might be done away or be rendered inactive or, or harmless or without power any longer. Uh, done away with that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. How many of you know a dead man cannot commit adultery? Do you ever notice that? Do you know a dead man cannot lie? A dead man cannot covet. A dead man cannot commit sin. You and I died with Christ, and therefore those that have died are free from the power of sin. Isn't that right? But yet we need to reckon ourselves, as the Scripture says, we need to consider ourselves as having died with Christ. Next time temptation comes, next time the, the, the temptation or the, or the prompting comes, the enticement comes to sin, you remind your body. Body, you died. You are dead. Sin nature, you are dead. I have power over you in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Because now the old man was crucified. And the new man has been risen together with Jesus Christ. Notice 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. There it is again. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Amen? And so what does it say? It says that if one died, who's that one? Jesus is that one. If one died for all or instead of all, then all died. And he died for all. Do you notice it didn't say that he died only for those that God chose? Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know there's a lot of theologians out there, a lot of churches out there, Reformed theology, some Presbyterian theology, that say, well, you know, God predestined some to be saved and some not to be saved. I think that that is one of the most demonic doctrines that's ever been propagated in the church of Jesus Christ. Some call it Calvinism, whatever. It is. This idea that God picked some to go to heaven and some not to go to heaven. In other words, some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. God pick it and, and not, not putting in there the idea that man has free will and responsibility to choose. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It says there that he died for all. He died for everyone. And there's many other scriptures that say he's not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. Amen? Amen. Is everybody all right today? Boy, I'll tell you, I want to stir you up, and man, you look like you need stirring up. But notice now, help me, Lord, this is hard plowing today. It says this, then all die, and he died for all that those. Here's the reason, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. He died for you, so should not we all live for him? Amen? If you died, you know, when I came into understanding a little bit more, you know, I accepted the Lord when I was 12. My grandfather died, and it devastated me. I was closer to him than anybody else. When I was 12 years old, I accepted the Lord because I had a grandmother who knew the gospel and, and was able to show me how to be saved. And so I accepted the Lord when I was 12. When I was 17, I had an experience, an encounter with the Lord. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and received that spiritual language. And then I began to hear the Word. I began to see the Word of God. And I realized, you know what? It's not about my plans for my life anymore. You know, I was 17 years old. How many of you know 17 years old? You know, a lot of folks, they have plans for their lives by then. Or at least they try to have plans for their life. Isn't that right? And so I had plans from 7th grade, from 7th grade to 12th grade, I had my own plan. How many of you know what I'm saying to you? I mean, you know, I had a plan. I, 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 actually, I actually took all the courses necessary in order to get into the college that I had a plan for. From 7th grade to 12th grade, I planned. But how many of you know when you understand that you died with Christ 
and the old man was crucified with him. It's not what my plans are anymore. It's what is his plan for my life and what is his plan for your life now. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter what our plans are. It's like Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said to the Father, Father, if this cup could pass from me, that's great. But he said, but not my will, but your will be done. That needs to be what the rest of us are believing and thinking as well. Amen? It's not about what we want. It's not our life. It's his life. Amen? We need to be reminded of these things. Again, that if he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Let's go on from here. I see a lot of people are either leaving or going to the bathroom all of a sudden. All right, so let's go on here. Discovering your identity in Christ. Going on. First of all, I said you died with Christ. Say, I died with Christ. The next one is you were made alive, raised up, and made to sit together with Christ. Again, notice what Ephesians says. And we're not turning there because all of you, you, you know, you, you want to go. And so we're going quicker here. But you write down those scriptures. If you have time to turn there, go ahead and turn there. But notice Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. How many of you know us means you? Boy, I'll tell you, man, I'll tell you, Father, I will not pastor a dead church. I need some life, man. How many of you know us means you? You ought to get excited about that. He made us alive. Amen. Say, he made me alive. Oh, look alive, look alive. All right, all right. And so notice now, made us alive together. Notice the phrase, with Christ. In fact, with this particular one, I love the word together, don't you? Because it's talking about being together with Christ. And notice he mentions it more than once. It says that we were what? We were made alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Everybody say together. Together with who? Together with Jesus Christ. United together. We not only died with Christ, but we were raised up with him. We were made alive and we are seated together with him positionally in heavenly places. Amen? Now, now what all does that mean? Well, you know, seated together with him has the idea he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is the Father's right hand. You and I in Christ are seated at the right hand of the Father. And it talks about in Ephesians 1, we won't take time to turn there, but the latter part of chapter 1, it deals with the fact that, that he, uh, 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 pr he conquered over principalities and powers. And the, the idea is that, he, uh, that God placed all of those things under his feet and made him to be the head of the church. Amen. And yet it talks about how he was seated at the right hand of the Father. So if he's seated at the right hand of the Father and all principalities and powers are under his feet and you and I in chapter 2, we are said to be seated with him. That means all principalities, demonic powers are under yours and my feet, which means you have dominion and power and authority in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so it's only because, though, it's because we're joined to him. There's no authority without being joined to him. Amen? All right, and so going on, discovering your identity. First of all, you died with Christ. Second of all, you have been what? You've been made alive. You've been raised up, and you've been seated together with him. Discovering your identity, you have an inheritance in Christ. Say, I have an inheritance. All right, let's just look at a couple of scriptures all together now. Notice Ephesians 1.11, in him. Notice that phrase, in him. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. In who? In Christ. You have an inheritance. That goes along with Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint or equal heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Now, some people say, suffered with him. Yes, yeah, suffered with him. How many of you know you suffered with him because you were seen as being on the cross when he suffered? Are you understand? Identification here. With him. See that phrase? With him, right? And then to go further into that chapter, it's also dealing with suffering in that you are taking authority over your flesh. How many of you know that can be a suffering as well, but you have the authority through the power of Christ. Amen? Say, I'm an heir of God. And an equal heir with Jesus Christ. And so, our identification, treated as the same. 
He died our death so that we could live His life. He took our unrighteousness so that we could have His righteousness. He took the punishment for unholiness so that we could have His holiness. He took our judgment so that we could be declared innocent. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And now we are treated as Him. We are treated as the same in the sense that we are seated together with Him, raised up together. Again, identify with what He did for you and me. It doesn't stop at the death and the burial, but it also comes along with the resurrection. Thank God for that spiritual resurrection where we are now walking in newness of life. And thank God there's a physical resurrection coming one day. Amen? Amen. And so again, we're talking about our identity. Who are we? Who are we? Who are you as a believer? The Bible says that you are royalty. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you are a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Revelation 1, 5 and 6 says that he has made us kings and priests unto God. And so we are royalty from God's perspective. How many of you know there's no higher monarchy than God in his kingdom? Isn't that right? The Bible says that we are priests. Same passage of 1 Peter 2. We are priests unto God. What is a priest? Somebody said, well, you know, I'm not a priest. Yes, you are. Every believe. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. Which means what? Which means that there are sacrifices that we make. Sacrifices, the sacrifice of giving, the sacrifice. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that we're to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. And so we're to give ourselves unto Him. We're to give our finances to Him. We're to, give, uh, we're to give our love. We're to give all sorts of things as a sacrifice. The sacrifice of praise and worship uh, as a priest unto God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Do you know a lot of people, they want to be royalty. They want to be kings, but they don't want to be priests. They like the idea of ruling and reigning. But you know what? Your ruling and reigning is only in proportion to your willingness to be a priest or one who sacrifices in spiritual sacrifices unto God. Amen? We could go into that a lot. The Bible says that you are a new creature. Say, I'm a new creature. The Bible says you're complete in Him. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, great passage. That you are complete in Him. People have this idea, I don't feel complete. I'm not married. I'm not complete. I want you to know that you are complete even if you're not married. Because your completeness is not found in marriage. Your completeness is found in Christ. If you're a believer, you're complete without being married. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You say, well, I thought that marriage meant a completeness. No, marriage just complements what you already have in Christ and brings two people together and brings power and strength that you don't have by yourself. But your completeness is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? You are His workmanship. Say, I'm His workmanship. You are righteous in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, very familiar to all of us. We're talking about your identity. You are righteous. It says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. What? In Him, in Him, that phrase. Many more things than what we could share. You are holy in Christ. You are a member of the body, an important member, each and every one. You are a citizen of heaven. You are accepted. Aren't you glad that you're accepted? If you feel like you've been wounded by rejection in your life, aren't you glad that you've been accepted by the most important person in the world, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? So you've been accepted, you have unconditional love because of Christ, and you have access to God. Thank God that now you have access. Amen? Because you are in Christ. You have access because you're in Christ. There's freedom. There's eternal life. There's victory. There's heavenly blessings. There's physical health and a whole bunch of other things that are part of the inheritance that you and I have as heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And so we don't have to be confused. Who am I? No, let me tell you who I am. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. I am an overcomer, and I overcome by faith. I am what? I am a son of the living God. I am what? I, I am a, a victor in Christ. I have the victory because thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Amen? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I have the mind of Christ. All these, I am the healed of the Lord. I am delivered from the powers of darkness, and I'm transferred into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1.13. And everything that I've said to you is not just about me. It's about all of us as believers and who we are in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray if the worship team would come. Father.